Hello there, I am Justina of Just Classical. I am a Christian and homeschooling mom of three, and I have been homeschooling my kids since they were in the womb. Yes, I taught music classes while I was pregnant, and more formally, I've been homeschooling for the last 12 years. I also founded Just Classical, where I provide music and art resources, memory songs, and encouragement for homeschool families. Today, I want to speak to you about Preparing Preschoolers for Homeschooling with Music, or Music and Its Importance in Your Child's Development. I want to show you two charts. The first one lists the stages of normal child development. So you can see that child development starts with listening or vestibular, then progresses to motor development, language development, social skills, emotional development, and cognitive development. Now let's look at the stages of musical development. Musical development begins with listening and vestibular, progresses to movement, then vocal skills, ensemble skills, creative skills, and reading and writing. Now that you've seen these two charts, I am going to talk about child development compared to music development and how music enhances child development at every stage, which is why structured music classes and activities are the perfect curriculum for preschoolers. First, let's look at normal child development by starting with development in the womb. The first sensory organ to function in the womb is the ear. The heart starts beating about 21 days after conception at 40 days, brain waves are measurable. At two months, all body systems are functioning. At 12 weeks or three months is when a baby starts hearing. And studies show that a baby can remember what he or she heard as early as 20 weeks. Dr. Susan Luddington Ho, the authority on infant stimulation, says the fetal heartbeat changes significantly to different types of music, both before and after birth babies are really bothered by strong beat and loud music, but they love soft music and are especially thrilled by Vivaldi. One example is of a professional pianist whose baby began to thrash about violently in the womb whenever she played Chopin, that's Frederick Chopin, so that she had to stop playing his compositions. But the baby seemed to love Mozart. Now Chopin is known for lively tunes, and Mozart is a little more structured and predictable. Another mother, when she went to a rock concert, had her ribs kicked so hard by her agitated baby in the womb that one of her ribs was broken. So babies do hear the music in the womb and they are affected by it. Now, the ear serves two purposes. It enables us to hear and it provides balance. Listening is the cornerstone of development for both normal child development and musical development. Now, we often ignore how important it is to listen because we live in a highly visual world where children and adults spend hours engaging our eyes on televisions, computers, video games, devices, our phones, right? But listening is essential. A baby first orders its world through sound. Since one is unable to see in the womb and since their sight is unfocused at birth. Yet, a baby is able to hear and distinguish his or her mother's voice in the womb. In order to communicate and develop language skills, one must learn to listen. It is important, too, to learn to discriminate between meaningful sound and noise. Also, listening enhances development of attention span, concentration, social skills, such as learning to listen to others, communication, sensitivity, compassion, and impulse control. Music enhances this foundational principle of listening because music is sound. One must listen in order to learn to discriminate pitch, rhythm, and voice or timbre. Also, music can be enjoyed at all ages and skill levels through listening. When involved in music, the ear is being engaged and trained to listen, 
neural pathways in the brain are firing and the proper foundation is laid for further development. Next in child development is motor skills. As the ear is the control center for the two functions of listening and the vestibular apparatus, which controls balance, it should be no surprise that motor skills are the second stage of development. There is an intimate psychophysical involvement between sound, hearing, and listening, the ear's cochlear function, and movement in terms of balance, position, and posture, the ear's vestibular function. Children by nature move constantly, so movement activities meet them where they're at. Also, physical movement helps children develop an internal sense of beat that seems to correlate with reading and math abilities. This is a quote from Jane Healy in Endangered Minds. And this is not merely hearing, but feeling the beat. Steady beat activities are important because they provide a sense of security because in the womb, babies are used to hearing the sound of the mother's heartbeat and breathing, right? Those steady beats. And they order a child's world and provide structure. They develop the aural motor connection and they are the basis for developing rhythm. Music obviously is a motivating factor in motor development for the natural response to music is to move to it. When young children hear a strong beat in a song, I often see them do this little dance of bouncing up and down. They are learning to develop that internal sense of beat. Music provides structure for the movement, for the beat serves as an endpoint for movement and a rhythmic cue. It's an outside source of pacing and provides auditory feedback. Music and movement activities also provide kinesthetic learning opportunities, experiencing the body move, building muscular movement memory, focus on feeling aspects of creative expression, aid in recall, and in understanding language and events, and stimulate participation. Further, movement activities are the foundation for cognitive learning and aid in the development of purposeful movement impulse control, gross and fine motor coordination, and eye-hand coordination, spatial concepts, and problem solving. So next, language skills come in this sequence of development. Children begin with nonverbal communication. Then they say one word at a time, ball. Then they connect nouns and verbs into short sentences. As they hear language spoken by adults and experiment actively with language themselves, they begin to speak in more complex sentences, modeling what they hear from the important people in their lives. Language, of course, is important for communication and for higher level reasoning. Now, just as language has patterns of letters, words, and phrases, and sentences, so does music. Music also imitates conversation. Phrases include questions and answers, silence, listening, and response. So as a child is exposed to the structure of music, language and communication patterns are reinforced. For example, a child will not stutter when singing because of the structure, the music puts the words into a predictable time format. Now, a note here to say, TV is not a good model for a child's language development. In most programming, the language is much too quick for the children to understand, and the language is dumbed down so that the complex sentences are not heard, nor a wide variety of vocabulary words. All right, next, children develop social skills in their development sequence. They must learn to interact with other people both other children and adults in an acceptable way. So they have to learn impulse control, like not hitting the kid who has a toy one once, right? And to take turns. They learn to use their words to work out conflicts and how to be sensitive and compassionate towards others' needs as well as their own. One of the most amazing aspects of music, in my opinion, is the social aspect of ensemble. Other activities promote social development, such as team sports, but these are aggressive interactions, which certainly have their place. Music, however, 
is an opportunity for people to work together to create something beautiful, whether it is unison singing or diverse parts that form exquisite harmonies. Music is an opportunity to learn positive social interaction through listening and expressing. Ensemble activities are also important because they develop creative expression, impulse control, and concentration as one focuses on one's part, communication, and understanding of parts and phrases in music. The next stage is emotional or creative expression. Children become more aware of their emotions and how to control them. Outlets may be sought to express emotions in a healthy way. Aggressive behaviors are appropriate in competitive sports, for example. And music can be an important outlet for expressing ourselves. As Hans Christian Andersen, the famous fairy tale writer said, where words fail, music speaks. That is why there is a field called music therapy and why many of us turn to listening to a favorite song for comfort or to playing an instrument for an emotional outlet. By exposing a child to music, he or she may find a wonderful outlet for emotions and creative expression. The pinnacle of development is cognitive reasoning. Children are reading, then writing, and ultimately thinking for themselves. We want them to be able to become responsible adults who contribute to society and forge new technology and relationships for our progress as a civilization. This cognitive level of development begins in the teen years. In music, reading and writing are the means of expression. As one can read music, one can participate in higher levels of music making, understanding not only the notes on a page, but the genre of the piece, the nuances of expression, etc. Now, one can also analyze the structure of the music and which notes make up the chords. Ultimately, one will be able to write new music as well. Now that we've seen how music development perfectly correlates with normal child development, let's look at a few other reasons that music prepares little children for homeschooling. So when I say preschool, you could think of the preschool years like ages three and four or just preschool because music can help your baby from the point that they're born up to when they are ready to start homeschooling. So first, music is interactive. I already mentioned that we live in an overly visually stimulating society. So another factor to consider about involvement in music is that it is interactive. While TV and computer software producers purport to offer educational programming, it is passive learning. Now listening to music can also be passive, mind you, which is why I will give you some ideas for participating more actively. But first I want to stress the importance of interactive learning rather than passive. In her book, Endangered Minds, Jane Healy proposes that while there is of course a genetic element to intelligent, environments can shape brains and intelligent levels. Environments can shape those. Studies were done with rats in which some were given an enriched environment with playmates and toys, such as wheels and balls, where they could explore and push and roll and climb. And other rats were in impoverished conditions of merely living in a cage. Those in the enriched interactive environment developed larger brain cortexes by as much as 11%. Now, interestingly, when rats were given an opportunity to watch other rats in the enriched environment, their brains did not grow any more than those of the rats in the impoverished cage. So the rats are interacting, their brain cortexes grow by 11%, and then you've got some who are in impoverished conditions, their brains don't grow, and then you've got some watching the active rats and their brains also do not grow. So the point here is that as author Jane Healy states, children need stimulation and intellectual challenges, but they must be actively involved in their learning, not responding passively while another brain, their teachers or parents laboriously develops new synapses in their behalf. And also not while a computer or a TV 
does all the work and they just sit there passively. Another consideration for how music is the perfect preschool curriculum is that there are critical periods of learning. The moment a child is born, neural pathways are developing and there are critical periods for some types of mental development. If the right stimulation isn't there at that time, a child will not develop in that area normally. Language is one of those areas. During a critical period before age two, a child's ear can hear the nuances in any language to be able to imitate those sounds later in speech. If a child is in a bilingual or multilingual home, he or she can learn to speak those languages without accents because he or she heard the nuances of the sounds during the critical period. But most of us Americans heard only English as infants. And so when we learn another language, we struggle with the correct pronunciation or accent to speak that language like a native speaker. So music also has a critical period of learning. This window of opportunity is until age nine. Children who are exposed to music at an early age easily develop a sense of steady beat and accurate pitch, regardless of if their parents exhibit these musical skills. Musical ability is not all genetic, but it can be developed during early childhood. Music educator Edwin Gordwin suggests that you cannot influence a child's aptitude for music after age nine, but you can only influence achievement after this age. Now, I would say that it is not impossible to learn music or develop the ability to match pitch and keep a steady beat after age nine, but it is much more difficult and unlikely that you will be able to do so. I have worked with 11 and 12 year olds who had no music experience until this age and who can still not match pitch. When I speak of matching pitch, I mean a call and a response of something like this. So me, and then this child would be able to sing it back to me perfectly. So me. Okay, so that's matching pitch. Now, also, music is a powerful educational tool. Songs are useful tools for you to invest in educating your child. The best way to memorize something is to a song, like the ABC song. Songs also teach language syntax. You can use songs to teach moral lessons and how to worship God. Music also instills in children an appreciation for the arts and motivates children to do activities of daily living, such as the cleanup song. Clean up, clean up, everybody do your share. It's much more motivating to clean up to a song, right, while we're singing, or uh, to get your child to move a little more quickly or slowly, depending on the need. Uh, a fun rhyme like quickly, quickly, very quickly, round the little mouse. Quickly, quickly, very quickly, all around the house slowly slowly very slowly rent the garden snail slowly slowly very slowly along the garden rail all right, so I exaggerated that, right? So you have a quickly part and a slowly part, and it's so much more motivating to do that little chant. And you can use that to inspire children to move quickly if you're in a hurry or to slow down, right? So that's why we learn these little songs, these little chants with our children. All right, so music is a powerful educational tool. Another reason music is important in early childhood is that it promotes family interaction. We live in a culture where in many families, both parents work and we all lead busy lives. Children's time with their parents may be limited if children are in daycare and parents may be tired when they do see their children. Thus, they may not make the effort to spend time developing a bond and promoting language and leisure skills. Let's face it, it is easier to set a child in front of a video than spend the energy it takes to talk with them, answer questions and play with them. But music can be an enjoyable activity for the whole family to participate in, no matter what your skill level or age, 
every member of the family can participate in music in some way, listening, moving, playing an instrument, or keeping a beat. By spending a few minutes each day singing to and with your children, you develop a bond with them as you share an experience together. This can be repeated day after day, and you may build memories together. So now we come to the more practical question of how we can participate in music with our children. As I have suggested, any experience that is going to enhance development must be active, not passive. So merely having music playing in your home or car is not an effective means of promoting musical participation. Listening is indeed important. We have established that it is the foundation of development. But this does not mean we should always have background noise going. In fact, children need time to develop filtering systems for moderating incoming sensory stimulation so that they are not overwhelmed and either tune out or act out behaviorally. For example, how do kids act after going to a place like Chuck E. Cheese? So if you don't know what Chuck E. Cheese is, it's a pizza place where they have these large mechanical dolls that do like a big, huge mouse and they have a band and they sing these songs and there's a lot of noise. There's video games, there's the music going on, there's food and sugar and kids running around and it is chaos, it is loud, okay? So how do kids act after going to a place like Chuck E. Cheese? They're going to act out they're going to be overstimulated, right? So that's why it is important for kids to develop these filtering systems for moderating these incoming sensory stimulation so they're not overwhelmed and act out. So periods of silence help children order their worlds just as rest is important for growth. They need also to be able to develop discriminating ears to distinguish between what is noise and what is important sound. So the first way I will suggest that you participate in music with your children is to enroll in music classes with them if this is financially feasible. These class times will provide structure and social interaction and be a springboard of ideas for you to take home so that you can interact musically with your child outside of class. So these classes are usually for babies and toddlers and preschoolers where you go with your child and you interact with your child musically. Now, many parents of especially babies and toddlers may say, I can do these musical activities at home by myself. I don't want to pay to go to a class. And this is true, especially if you have some music experience yourself. And I will give you more ideas to do this at home. But I also want to remind you that we all have good intentions of doing certain things with our children, but then never set aside the time to do them. So enrolling in a class may be the structure you need. And as homeschooling parents, I will further add, so often we think we should be doing these other things, and so music gets pushed to the side because a lot of people think it's just an elective. Well, I'm here telling you, it's not just an elective. This is the critical time that you should be doing music with your children is in these early years, and you can integrate it with all the other subjects throughout the years as well. So anyway, enroll in a musical class if that is in your financial budget. I have a freebie available for you also called Music Activities for Your Homeschool, in which I have a list of different types of activities you can do with your children and why they are important. So I have ordered these activities in the same order as the child and musical development we have discussed. So let's talk about them a little bit here. First, our listening activities. So my first idea in listening activities is to take time to sit and listen with your child to short excerpts of songs when they're at a young age or full songs and works like a whole symphony for older children and do this with different genres you can listen to short excerpts of classical music or a short folk song or children's pieces or your favorite type of music taking into consideration if the lyrics are appropriate for children to hear so just sitting and listening to these short excerpts or short songs. Uh, secondly, if you have recordings of different animal sounds or instruments, take time to listen to these short clips and take time to identify what is making these sounds. Now, if you wanna do this with 
recordings of instruments, I recommend the narrated versions of Sergei Prokofiev's Peter and the Wolf or Benjamin Britten's A Young Person's Guide to the Orchestra. Third, for listening activities, you could listen to stories of composers and their music or stories with musical accompaniment. Maestro Classics has some great ones of these or classical kits. So they tell you the story of the composer while the music is playing in the background, or they have a story of a book with great musical accompaniment. Also, you can choose a classical composer to focus on for a month and listen to recordings each day from that composer. Maybe repeat the same recording five days in a row to become very familiar with it so that you and your child know a repertoire of works from that composer. So composers to consider studying would be uh, Johann Sebastian Bach, George Friedrich Handel, Antonio Vivaldi, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, Joseph Haydn, Ludwig von Beethoven, Johannes Brahms, Frederick Chopin, Piotr Ilyich Tchaikovsky, Claude Debussy, Camille Saint-Saëns, Leonard Bernstein, Aaron Copeland, Benjamin Britten, etc. Okay, there's so many wonderful composers out there with little, the, even short pieces you can listen to. Now, if you combine this with history as you read about the composers and the era they lived in, guess what? You're integrating subjects. All right, so those are listening opportunities. Um, also, and that, that might work better with slightly older children, but with little children, again, you can sit outside and listen to animals and birds and see if you can identify what is making the sounds. Just try and sit and be silent and see what you hear. And very importantly here for listening, sing to your child while rocking, if they're still very little, or doing some other kind of movement, or while you're working or in play. Now, again, why do all these listening activities? Remember, listening is important because it is the cornerstone of development and overall child development. It's the foundation for motor, language, social, emotional, and cognitive development, as well as the foundation for musical development. And listening activities are important because they develop discrimination of pitch, rhythm, language, voice or timbre, uh, concentration, social skills, and impulse control. And music can be enjoyed at all ages and skill levels through listening. All right, so those are the listening activity ideas. Let's move on to study B activity ideas. So study B is simply keeping time, just like when we clap along to a song, right? Uh, so let's use a recording with a good steady beat. And this can be any genre. You just want a nice strong beat and clap along with the beat. So like a march from John Philip Sousa is a good example. It's really fun to clap along to something like that, right? Now you don't just have to clap along. You could tap your knees. You could tap your shoulders. You can tap other body parts. This develops body awareness too. You can stomp your feet. You can rock side to side or back and forth with a, a parent or partner. Um, you can sway. You can bounce um, your child on your lap to keep that steady beat. You can march, jump, hop, gallop, skip, nod, okay? Come up with ideas for different movement activities that you can do in a steady beat to a song. So the point is to do these movements to the beat, okay? Not to just get wild and crazy dancing, okay? Do this movements to the beat to instill that sense of beat. Also, you can sing a song and do movements to the beat. So you can include starting and stopping in the middle of the song to enhance listening and impulse control. Also, you can play small rhythm instruments to the beat of the song. So you can do the song with live singing or to a recording, and you can use sticks or shakers, bells, a triangle, small cymbals, beat a drum. So again, Try using instruments instead of movements to instill that sense of steady beat. Now remember, steady beat activities are important because they provide a sense of security to small children because in the womb, babies were used to hearing their mother's heartbeat and breathing. And steady beat activities also order a child's world and provide structure 
They develop the aural motor connection. Remember the ear serves two purposes, hearing and vestibular. And steady beat activities are the basis for developing rhythm. Let's move on to a third area of music activities that you could include with your small children or even into the homeschool years. And those are call and response of patterns. So when I say call and response, it means I'm gonna say something and the child is gonna say it back. So you can chant a simple rhythm to your child using the syllables ba, ba, and you have them say it back to you. Now, I like to pretend I have a microphone or I have a stick that I can hold as a microphone or a spatula from the kitchen. And so that can make it fun. You can be anywhere with your pretend microphone, right? A spoon, a stick, whatever, or just an invisible microphone. So that makes it creative. So you can take it and you can say, ba, ba, and you hold it out for the child and they say it back to you. Now your older children are not gonna wanna do that, but that's for, for very little children. And then if you have older children, um, if you have established this call and response with them in these patterns, then you can also use a special rhythm language. Um, there's a particular one I like to use by Edwin Gordon, and it's with do, do, do day, do, do today to do day. Okay, and, and so you can look up Edwin Gordon and find out his rhythm language, or I also do some of those patterns in some of my classes. All right, so you can do the call and response of patterns for rhythm, okay, that simple rhythm, or you can do call and response of patterns for tonal patterns. So a tonal pattern is when you sing something to your child, and again, you can use the invisible microphone, bum, bum, and your child will sing it back. And you're, the point is you want them to match your pitch. And at first they may not match your pitch, but the more you practice it, the better they'll get at it. So you can also use solfege with older children. At first, it's nice to use a neutral syllable. Um, so they're not worried about what words am I saying with this? I'm just focusing on the pitch. But um, so that's why I sing bum, bum. Um, once they're older, you're gonna use the solfege, which is so me, so me do. Okay, so I'm pausing just so they could sing it back. Okay, so those are important patterns, call and response patterns. And the reason patterns are important is because they're the understandable building blocks of music, just like words, phrases, and sentences are the building blocks of language and reading. And when you use these patterns, you are developing the music vocabulary. And doing patterns is also important because it develops oral training, memory, that sense of rhythm and pitch, confidence, social skills in working together and in taking turns, attention span, and the ability to sequence information. All right, let's move on to movement activities. Now, remember, I gave you some movement activities in the study beat activities idea um, for bigger movements, but for young children, nursery rhymes and finger plays are teaching tools for body awareness and language. So sing and do the actions to action songs like the itsy bitsy spider climbed up the water spout. Down came the rain and washed the spider out. Out came the sun and dried up all the rain. And the itsy bitsy spider climbed up the spout again. Okay, so those action songs that gets them doing that fine motor movement, and big uh, gross motor movement, and associating actions and words together. It teaches body awareness and language, all right? So nursery rhymes and finger plays are invaluable to young children. Um, also, you can use a recording of expressive classical music or a piece with a story and act out the song with creative movement. Or you can dance with props to a song. Um, you can use props like scarves. So if you have a nice slow flowing song and you move with the scarf slowly, and then you can see the beauty of the scarf moving through the air and it helps with expression. Or you can use hoops where they're using the hoops with the song or jumping through hoops, different kinds of things. Hats make good props for movement activities. Lots of different kinds of props you can use for movement. 
Also, you can sing a song about movement and you can start and stop within that song. So one of my favorites is, oh, well, you walk and you walk and you walk and you stop. Oh, well, you walk and you walk and you walk and you stop. So of course, while you're singing about walking, the children are walking. And as soon as you sing stop, they are supposed to stop. And so that's teaching impulse control, right? And you can, um, make it less predictable because I sang the song exactly as is, but you could extend the walking part. Oh, well, you walk and 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 you stop. And you can kind of surprise them with when the stop is so that they're walking and they're really having to listen to when to stop. Okay, this, this is not a hard song, right? And even if you don't know the songs that I know, you can make up stuff like that for your kids and help them to start and stop and work on that movement and that control, that body control. Now, movement activities are important because motor development is the second step after listening in the child's overall development, right? And remember, the ear serves for the two purposes. It is the hearing or cochlear, and it's the balance or vestibular. So there's that intimate psychophysical involvement between the sound and the hearing and the listening, the ear's cochlear function, and movement in terms of balance, position, and posture, the ear's vestibular function. Yes, I said that before. I'm repeating it. It's very important. Sound, hearing, and movement. So children, of course, by nature move constantly, and so the movement activities meet them where they're at. Remember, they're learning in a kinesthetic way. They're experiencing the body move. They're building the muscular movement memory. They're focusing on feeling aspects of creative expression. And that movement aids in recall and in understanding language and events. And movement stimulates participation. Movement activities are the foundation for cognitive learning. And they aid in the development of purposeful movement, impulse control, gross and fine motor coordination and eye-hand coordination, spatial concepts, and problem solving. All right, let's move on to singing activities. Now, singing, of course, can be incorporated into any of the above activities. And as I demonstrated with the walk and stop song, it is valuable to sing some of the songs because you can control when the movement is going and when it's stopping. And you can also control the tempo of the song. Maybe you need to slow things down so it's just better to be able to control it with how fast you're singing, whereas a recording, you can't control the speed up, right? All right, so singing can be incorporated into any of the activities. Also, sing to your child in anything and everything. Don't worry if you don't think your voice is exceptional or if you don't think you can carry a tune. Your child doesn't care about the quality of your voice, but that you are making the effort to interact with them in this way. So sing favorite songs together. Sing along to favorite recordings. Take familiar tunes and make up your own words to assist in daily activities or to make a special song about your child. That's a lot of fun, you know, just even um, potty training. I made up songs to encourage them that this is now toilet time and you're gonna <laughs> use the toilet, right? I mean, that might sound weird, but it just made everything more enjoyable. Okay, I'm putting you to bed and I'm dressing you and singing a little song about it, right? So, um, and making up words or a special song for your child. Like I would take the song bingo, B-I-N-G-O, and I would replace those letters with my child's name spelled out. Um, so you can also take a familiar song and change the lyrics to be a little silly or to personalize the song. So you can say, you know, the wheels on the bus. Instead of doing that, you could say, the wheels on the wagon go round and round, or the wheels on the truck, or the wheels on the street cleaner. Or you can say, instead of old MacDonald had a farm, you can personalize it for your child. Little Johnny had a zoo and on in his zoo, he had a giraffe, you know, or little Johnny had a band and in his band, he had a tuba. And then you go, oompa, oompa, right? For the tuba. So take some familiar songs, change the lyrics, be a little silly, have fun with it. And as the skill develops for singing, practice rounds together. Okay, so there's lots of rounds out there that are very simple that you can practice together as a family and see how much fun this can be as a family. All right, singing activities are important, again, because they develop the oral training and listening skills. 
They develop a child's voice because they can explore vocalizations and sounds, and they develop language. They also develop creative and emotional expression and social skills because you're learning to work together in unity or to diversify into parts. So next, let's talk about ensemble activities. Well, one ensemble activity is to sing rounds together. That's probably the simplest way to do it. You can take a song like Frere Jacques, Frere Jacques, Dormez-vous. So right where I came on Dormez-vous, a second set of people comes in on the Frere Jacques. Okay, and you can create a round together. Uh, you can also create a speech ensemble by having one person speak a repeating part. So let's take the song, row, row, roll your boat gently down the stream. So somebody could just sit there and say, row, 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 while the person is singing, row, row, row your boat. And another person could be saying, rowing, rowing, rowing. And you see that's twice as fast as the person saying row. So this gives you two parts. And then the third person would be singing, row, row, row your boat. So there you go. There's an ensemble. It can be as simple as that. It doesn't have to be everybody singing a part. Uh, you could be singing the tonic and the dom. Or I'm sorry, yeah, tonic and dominant. So, bum, bum, row, 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 while the other person singing row, row, row your boat. So you could have another singing part in there, right? All right. Another way is to play different rhythms on an instrument. Different rhythms instruments okay so if you're doing um you could be doing rowing rowing so let's say those are quarter notes you could be playing sticks do 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 and then you could be playing the row row on a drum okay those would be half notes row row and then shakers twice as fast as the quarter notes okay so you can do different um, lengths of notes on different instruments to help create an ensemble. Now, ensemble activities are important because they develop creative expression and there is impulse control necessary and concentration because you have to focus on your own part. There's social skills because we're taking the parts to make up the whole and as the differing skills come together to act as a unit, we're working on our social skills. Um, we're working on communication and we're working on understanding of parts and phrases in music and ensembles are an opportunity for humans to work together in a non-aggressive way to create something beautiful now music and academics music itself is an educational tool songs with lyrics are useful tools for you to invest in educating your child especially as a memory tool like the abc song or for learning language syntax so Use music in education and academics as a memory tool. Memorize everything to a song. You can make up your own little songs or chants if you don't feel like you're good at making up tunes. You can make these up. Or there's lots of great tools out there with um, songs already made for you. ABC song, of course, multiplication table songs, uh, memorize Bible verses, memorize catechisms facts and history, science and math and geography. You can memorize them all to a song. There's lots of resources for that out there. Also, you can use songs to teach activities of daily living. As I said earlier, it's more motivating to clean up a room singing, clean up, clean up, everybody do your share. Clean up, clean up, everybody everywhere. Okay, that's from Barney. It's so much more motivating to do that than to just say, pick up your choice. So make up a song to brush your teeth to make your bed, to put away the dishes. You can make up little songs. It's more motivating. Uh, thus, the next point, use songs for motivation. So when a child is slow to do something, use that slowly, slowly, and, and kind of motivate them, right? That's the slowly part. And so you're gonna wanna get them to the quickly, quickly, very quickly, close the little mouse. You can do that. Um, so you can turn the activity into a game to slow them down uh, if they're too hyper or to speed them up if they're going too slowly. All right, so you want to chant and bring out those contrasts to make it more fun. Um, also, you can teach children how to worship God by singing hymns and praise songs, right? 
and you can teach moral lessons through song. So those are some of the academic uses or just life skills uses. And then I just wanted to say a couple things about selecting a music program. Um, if you want to enroll them in a music program, if that is possible for you, look for a program that is not merely entertainment, but is a music and movement program that will lead to musical fluency. So a strong musical foundation is important. So research the different programs, um, not merely based on price, but on quality of the program and the materials. It's emphasis on music education and interactive versus passive learning. So a few places you can look for that are at the websites of a program called Music Garden. That's what I taught for 20 years. So it's M-U-S-I-K-G-A-R-T-E-N dot com. Okay, so that's a great resource for finding early child music classes. And Kinder Music, K-I-N-D-E-R-M-U-S-I-K is another one, and Music Together. So there's probably other programs out there at this point, but those are a few that I would recommend. So look up their websites and then talk to the local teachers. So here's a few questions you want to ask. What is the goal of your program? So you don't want to hear entertainment, right? We're not going just to entertain our children. We really want a solid music education goal. Is the program based on the latest research in child development and updated accordingly? Does the program have the child in mind or the parents? So programs for children are going to have a lot of repetition because that is how children learn. Um, we're not just trying to impress the parents. Uh, we The children need that repetition. So make sure that they don't just go through a song once and move on to something else. That does not develop attention span either. Uh, what training do teachers of this program receive? What materials are required? It is great if the programs do come with some materials and what is the quality of the materials so i know i like i said i taught music garden and they have really high quality wooden sticks and shakers and really nice bells so it's it you want materials that are going to last because if you just buy a cheap set of musical instruments that are like toys in the toy section those are usually made out of plastic and they're going to break very easily so let's it's, it's important to have nice materials. Are the classes broken up by age group and developmental levels or are all ages included in one class? Now, sometimes you're gonna find a family class where you can go with your whole family and, and that can be really great um, financially, but it's also really important for you to go to classes that are broken up by ages if possible. So go to one class with your baby and a different class with your toddler, if at all possible, because babies are at a different level than toddlers. Toddlers need to move all the time. Babies, they need us to rock them and bounce them and just do things a little more slowly at first. Are the classes, are the activities interactive? Uh, another question, are the activities developmentally appropriate for the child's age group? Like I said, the difference between babies and toddlers. Is there an emphasis on oral training? So that's the training of the ear and listening. What is the parent's level of involvement in the classes and why? Now, you want to go to these classes when your kids are little, but once they get to older preschool age, like four or five, they're, might, they're maybe not going to want their parent in there with them as much, and they're not going to participate as well if the parent is with them. And so there is a point where it's time for the child to not be the parent. But I also know other programs where they teach piano and recorder and guitar in the program and the parent is with them the whole time. And I think they start at four or five until they're about eight or nine. And that way the parent knows exactly what the child is doing and can work with them at home. So there's different philosophies on those, but you need to know what your level of involvement in the classes is and why. And then another question to ask is, at what age do parents attend or not attend classes with their children and why? So that's just kind of a follow up on what I was talking about. So you want to select a program with a teacher that you and your child get along with. Now, most studios will let you observe or participate in a trial class for free. If your child doesn't like the teacher, it may affect his or her desire to participate in music in the future. And he or she may say, I don't like music. 
when really he or she has a personality conflict with the teacher or had one negative experience. So selecting a teacher your child likes and who motivates your child is especially important when starting private instruction on an instrument. There's no reason to turn a child off to music in a structured setting because of one teacher. So you can try out teachers, you can look around for one that is a good fit for you and your child. All right, I have shared a lot of information with you, but this is what I'd like to conclude with. Music is something we can enjoy and participate in from birth to death. It is a great enhancement throughout each stage of development. Whether or not you want your child to be a proficient musician, he or she will benefit from participating in active music making. I hope I have convinced you of this. As Paul Harvey said, for anyone to grow up complete, music education is imperative. But lastly, I encourage you to expose your children to music simply for its own sake. This quote from a parent and reader of Zero to Three magazine summarizes it. I can't imagine a world without music. I'm sorry academics haven't argued more forcefully for the gift of music in children's lives simply for its own sake, for the beauty and light it brings into daily existence, rather than bowing to the pressure to tack on academic value, as in Mozart helps kids build math skills, etc. It's enough that the world was graced with Mozart's brilliant music to play it so new generations of children hear it as part of being human. So if you want help in adding music to your homeschool, I would love to help you. A great place to get started is with my unit study called Investigating the Orchestra with Carnival of the Animals. Now that's a great unit study, especially for younger children. Um, I don't do all of the classes for babies, toddlers, and preschoolers at this point, but for preschool, investigating the orchestra with carnival animals is a great place to start with some of the movement and listening that I was talking about. I also have courses for elementary and middle school kids, such as the Composer Detective, a music appreciation course for families, and Making Music with Handel, which focuses on music fundamentals and teaching the tin whistle. Now, I have a special shtick to this. I dress up as George Friedrich Handel, the Baroque era composer, to lead you and your children through these courses. And you may also be interested in the artist detective, where Rembrandt, again, that's me dressed up, leads your child in learning about great artists and their works. And in drawing with Rembrandt, a beginning drawing course for elementary students, I dress up as Rembrandt and lead your child in learning to draw using the elements of shape while breaking things down into steps. I also have a membership, the Just Classical Fine Arts membership, which guides you through both music and art for a low monthly subscription. So thanks for joining me today. I hope this will help you prepare your preschoolers for homeschooling with music. And again, I am Justina of Just Classical, and I hope to connect with you through some of my resources, through email or on Facebook or YouTube.